So, uh, today we have Tracy Chevron here. Uh, he's somebody who I've been following for several years, uh, on and off through his YouTube channel. And, uh, the reason why I wanted to speak with him was because I find his style of training or, uh, training split that he's spoken about before very unique and interesting and uh it's different than a lot of uh splits that you hear about today you know we're always bombarded with uh this idea that high frequency training is the way to go you know that you should hit the muscle three times a week uh squat bench deadlift three times a week for example and um the problem is a lot of people after a while uh, doing that, especially as they get uh, more advanced, they start being able to lift a lot heavier, they start to run into recovery issues. Um, now, there are things that we can do. We can have a heavy day, light day, for example. Um, but depending on somebody's psychology, that may not be the way that they want to train. Um, and also, uh, lifting... Uh, heavy compounds multiple times a week can can oftentimes become a long you know two hour long session for example uh it can definitely interfere with somebody who's you know working a nine to five job or has kids or family or um all other obligations so uh i really wanted to bring tracy on because i wanted to you know hear his perspective and uh, just discuss how he came about this low frequency uh, training and um, we'll go from there. So Tracy, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, first, thanks for inviting me on, Stephen. And um, my, so my bastion head on YouTube, if anybody wants to check out that channel. Um, I grew up in the 90s i was a teenager and i'd been interested in bodybuilding since i was a little kid but i started training pretty regularly around age 14 or 15 and came across you know the arnold's encyclopedia of bodybuilding type uh approach and even back then you know everything was magazine based there was no internet yet and um it was not much different than now way too much volume recommended i had no idea i was naive to that but you know i I would be training um, almost every day between four and six days a week, most of the time, hours per session. And I, w I was lean, no doubt about it, but I wasn't gaining any muscle after about a year. And it doesn't take long before you start getting like desperate for, for some something to, to get some gains again. And I think I hadn't made any progress in a year or so. And I came across these heretical articles by Mike Mincer in like, I think it was in Flex magazine. And his approach was uh, taken largely off of Arthur Jones. And I thought that was very interesting. I, I just thought, I'm going to try an experiment. I haven't made a, a bit of gains in a year. And I'm only like 16 years old at this time. Uh, I'm going to try this wacky program, or at least something close to it, and see what happens. And uh, one thing Mincer says is you should see results, uh, noticeable if not impressive results, on a workout-to-workout -workout basis. You know, I'll give the example of my squat. I had plateaued with my workout weight. I could do seven to eight reps with, on squat um, for a solid year, right? Doing squats two to three times a week. And I took a week or two off for any training, went in, and within nine weeks, added 45 pounds. So I, I just added five pounds per week. And within nine weeks, I was squatting what, uh, two, 225 plus 45, what is that, two, 270 for the same reps. And so that, that was a like a, you know, it was immediate, significant results and um, was like the bang on the head that I needed to like try something different. Maybe, uh, maybe lower frequency is better. And what I started to notice was um, after a few years, adding in extra rest time in there. So for a while, it was each muscle group once a week. And I didn't go to quite the low volume that Mincer recommended, which was like one all out set per body part. I might do three to five sets. Uh, to failure. So for, for legs, for instance, I might do two or three sets of squats to failure and one or two sets of leg press, and that would be it for my thighs. And um, as you were just mentioning, once once you start getting higher poundages up there, that's just more of a demand on your body overall. 
and I found it required more time off rather than less. So I don't think advanced lifters need to be doing more work, but less rather, because the if you're training to failure, um, that accumulated uh, workload is just, it's hard for your system to recover from. At least that, that was my experience. And um, I guess just kind of more of my personal history. Um, I went to Kansas State University and got a degree in biochemistry, <laughs> mainly just because I wanted to understand better how exercise worked. And I uh, thought I'd be going to graduate school and actually was accepted into a PhD program at University of Illinois, Chicago, but declined that because I, that was kind of a critical point in my life where I was just recognizing what, what it means to be a research scientist. I mean, it, it's sitting at a desk asking for money all day long. That wasn't the life <laughs> I really wanted to live, so um, I became a biology lab technician for 10 years and um, have done like recreational, uh, competitive but recreational cycling and gardening and all kinds of other stuff that put a lot of demands on, on my body too. And, you know, things that I want to live like a, a multi-dimensional life, not a one-dimensional life in the gym. So uh, that low frequency, low time commitment training had a lot of um, benefits into a what I would consider a more reasonable lifestyle for most people. I, I didn't have kids, but um, certainly it's very amenable to anyone who has other demands on their time besides uh, gaining muscle. Right. I um, I have a friend. His name's Kyle Mamunis, and he's a PhD in nutrition. And he's he's explained that uh, it's not all it's cracked up to be <laughs> um, in academia. Uh, you know, oftentimes the studies that really tell us something are going to run over the course of years. And um, the way a lot of PhDs improve and um, improve their career and get famous is by publishing all these short term studies. And uh, I found the same thing in uh, kinesiology in the field, uh, exercise science, exercise physiology. Uh, and so where that relates to this conversation is with, with high frequency, we have a lot of short term studies with that, like six to, to eight or six to 12 weeks long. And oftentimes they use untrained individuals or college students, right? Or, or for, they have youth on their side in terms of recovery ability, but also that at least my experience at that time of life was uh, a lot more free time, a lot less physical demands on my body. So you can, it's it's an it's a cohort of individuals that are likely to be able to recover much better than the average working adult. I would say. True. Yeah. Um, and so what we've what we see in some of these studies is there there seems to be an improvement. Um, you know, biased on the side of high frequency, uh, but we don't always know what would happen if uh, those studies would ca would be carried out over the course of a year or two years, because realistically, people just can't keep gaining muscle and strength at the same rate like that, um, and so we just don't have the research. So we have this idea that's uh, touted by a lot of exercise physiologists, experts out there that says... Uh, you know, low frequency doesn't work because X, Y, Z study. But um, I have just found in myself that high frequency for me worked in the beginning when I was a beginner and say lifting, uh, squatting like 135 pounds three times a week. But um, just as an example, when I was squatting in the 300s, and doing that multiple times a week, I, it just buried me. Um, yes. So I had to do something. And so, you know, I started experimenting with light days, heavy days, and that worked too. But um, taking out the light days entirely and just squatting once every seven days or nine days, for example, I haven't really noticed that much of a difference. I still make progress. So that's just me as an example. Um, but, um, how, so how do you feel, uh, with, with how that relates to your experience? Um, so something I always, I've always done is 
I, I will still do the movement, but with very light weight. So um, that split that I kind of arrived at by trial and error over my first several years of training, a four-day split, um, even though I only trained each muscle group um, hard one time in that rotation, my core movements, which for me were always the squat and the straight leg deadlift, I did those with very light weights and often just the bar. And I might do two sets of 20 or 25 of each of those two exercises as part of my general warm-up. So my body's still going through that motion, okay. but not with any load that's going to pose a, um, a, um, a stress to my body, right? So I think there are all kinds of caveats in here. But, and one is um, if you're only – and suppose you're going to do a whole body workout and you're only going to do that once a week. Well, that's if that's your only exercise session for the whole week – you're going to not have great cardiovascular fitness to carry you through that arduous workout. So um, general cardiovascular fitness is one. And then also frequently enough, and it, I would say at least every few days, doing some real light core movements helped me out a lot. So that when I did have that heavy squat day, I would my body would feel in the groove and I didn't you know have aches and pains to work out, that kind of thing. Um, working anywhere near failure, I found, uh, requires – for me, at least a full week to just recover, let alone um, super compensate from that stimulus, right? And I, I like to think in analogies a lot. And one of the things, like if you get if you get a pretty bad sunburn, or if you cut yourself, or if you get a, a nasty cold or flu, it takes on the order of about two weeks generally, right? Somewhere between one and three weeks usually to, yeah. to recover and feel 100% again. And I think it's no different. If you put yourself through a really intense kind of um, major muscle group uh, weight training session, if you're training to failure, even if it's not multiple sets of the same exercise, but um, if you're if you're taking, I don't know, um, six to twelve sets to failure in, during a workout, that's that's a, a serious challenge to your system to recover from that. And I w I always used soreness, the delayed onset muscle soreness, as a gauge. Um, First of all, for the effectiveness of an exercise, but also however many days I was sore, I would give myself at least that many days after the soreness is completely gone. So if I if I were sore for four days, I wouldn't even think about hitting that muscle group again for at least eight days from the previous workout. So I, the, the day that the soreness is gone means, I'm, okay, I'm back to zero. And then I give myself however, however deeper into I've got to climb back out of that hole. And then somewhere above the, the surface, right, where I, where I started. So I guess that's an analogy I would use to describe um, the philosophy of that, of that approach. Right. So when you, were, when you were training with like a higher frequency, uh, when you were experimenting with those routines, uh, what, like, what types of uh, ex – what did you feel as far as fatigue and, and how did you – come to realize that uh, it wasn't for you, basically. So even as a teenager with the boundless energy of, of youth and the insane recovery ability, in which everyone will appreciate as you age, that recovery ability goes down um, probably exponentially with age. Um, but uh, even as a teenager and being all uh, psyched to, to, you know, get swole and everything, uh, it would be hard to motivate myself to work. And that's not so big of a deal, but the biggest thing was getting sick all the time, you know, getting getting really bad bronchitis or pneumonia three, four, five times in one year. That's not normal, right? And um, before too long, you notice a pattern that, oh, after a particularly brutal training session, one or two days later, you come down with that, uh, whatever it is, a flu, a cold. And that happened for between age 14 and 16 and by 16 and 17 is when I was starting to experiment with the lower uh, lower frequency stuff um, I was just it seemed like I was constantly sick or, or recovering from some, some nasty cold which had never been a problem before the, the training so that's probably the number one thing that let me know I'm just I'm just like like I say all, all the time I'm just digging myself a deeper hole and um, I don't know it, if you can't achieve a, stimu a proper stimulus within a few sets, I don't know what doing several more is going to do. It's a, 
trial and error is the only thing that really will convince you 100%. You can look at all the, the data presented by the white coats and uh, you just got to try it. And that's what I did. And uh, I tried both systems and, oh, look at this one. I don't feel run down. I don't feel unmotivated. I'm not getting sick and I'm gaining rather than, pla than plateauing. So it was just based on the results mainly. Right. They were convincing. Now for me, I, I did dabble a little bit in, in Mike Menser's uh, routines, uh, high intensity training. And I was doing, you know, one ramp ramping up to one heavy set of like 10 for a while and that worked but after a while it stopped working and uh so i i started realizing i did need some more volume than just one heavy set so one of the things that i i don't want anybody who's watching this to get the idea that tracy and i are saying that you just come in once a week or once every two weeks and just do one one set because one of the things you'll realize if you watch, I encourage everybody to go to uh, Bastion Head's channel and look at some of his workout videos and he's doing multiple sets with like 315 or, or more than that with squats. And so that builds a adaptation, you know, uh, a, you know, corresponding adaptation with increased muscle and size and strength. Um, anyway, how do you feel about like uh, volume per session? Do you find that to be important or? Uh, I think there's, I think there's a reasonable range of volume. And if, sure. if whatever you're going through in life, like maybe you're going through finals or something, you're a student, that's a good time to probably back off and maybe only do that one set. And um, it is possible to not only not lose your gains, but to make gains with just one set. Uh, caveat here, one thing, one reason I used more than just that single set, even though I knew the single set would probably have sufficed, I just needed like the mental cathartic like reset. So exercise is always a, um, a coping mechanism for me, you know, the um, just dissipating stress. And uh, I needed that, um, that like, abandon level exertion physical exertion to clear my mind and um so i, I know i did for multiple sets probably more than were really necessary um just for the mental aspect but what's a reasonable range i think somewhere between one and maybe five sets right but i'm also taking i was taking close to two weeks off between training sessions so if you're going to do that extra volume um, I would recommend maybe also take an extra recovery or day or two to compensate. Sure. Uh, do you need 10 sets? Absolutely not. I, I, I just, you know, I think also in terms when you're young, it's not so big of a deal, but that's, that's cumulative wear and tear on your joints too. Yeah. Every time you get under the bar, there's a risk of injury associated with that. And you're, you have a, a very small, like you have a very diminishing returns, uh, add on effect of each successive set but the risk of injury remains the same or goes up, um, you know, linearly with each successive set. So there's a, there's a risk benefit, uh, compromise there to be made too. So, um, it, and it depends on the, uh, the exercise you're doing too. You could probably do 20 sets of curls without overloading your whole system, but don't try it with squats or deadlifts. Right. Right. That, yeah, uh, I don't know if you have heard of uh, the massage therapist Paul Ingraham from Canada, but uh, I mentioned him in the talk with Clarence, and I'll have to sh I'll have to share you an article from him, all talking about this. How basically every successive set after you know a few sets has diminished returns. So you're. I mean, from what I've seen, I, I absolutely agree with that. After about five sets, you're maybe getting like in the single digit percent benefit m extra. So, right. And it gets uh, incrementally worse after that. So like where three sets might be really effective, four sets is not that much more. Five sets is not much more than that. And then after that, it's like it's only impeding your recovery. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So if you're trying to achieve like 100% benefit of an exercise session, um, and that 
let's say we could uh, we could actually measure it somehow and find out that that's six sets to failure, right? Well, if the first three of those sets got you 90% of that benefit, is it worth doing the last three? Because you've you've doubled your body's exertion, right? And so right. the demands on your CNS and all that are doubled for this additional 10% of benefit. To me, it's not worth it. Right. And also the time commitment too. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So, uh, yeah, a lot of people um, have this experience. Have you heard of Mark Ripito at all, a starting strength? I, I, don't know, I don't know specifics, but, yeah, it's, it's a name I'm familiar with. Yeah, so uh, he has a pretty good program for beginners. It's like three sets of five, uh, bench, squat bench, overhead press, deadlift, and you train um, three, three of those compounds three times a week. So... Um, I think it's good for beginners because it, it helps like build the movement patterns and, and build the, um, you know, neuromuscular efficiency yeah, a- for those lifts. But the problem a lot of people run into is they'll, they'll either run a three by five or a five by five way too long. And, um, you know, if you're adding five pounds each week, um, before you know it, you're squatting and you're benching a lot of weight and, a lot of people aren't going to be able to recover from that. So uh, that was my experience. Like um, I had to really like reassess what I was doing and do a lot more reading. And, and that's normal because uh, after the beginner stages, training oftentimes can get more complex in terms of you have to really pay attention to your, your recovery, whereas a beginner doesn't really have to as much mm-hmm. so and the, the higher um well, frequency and volume i think can be beneficial to a beginner as long as you don't have too high of an intensity either in terms of load or you know perceived exertion because like you said you've got to learn those movements and there's just no other way to do it besides reps and reps right and uh but there's yeah there comes a point when the loads are starting to get up enough where you're starting to approach failure intensities and that to me I just I call this concept the zone of failure. If you're in or near the zone of failure, that is where you have to pay extra attention or careful attention to your your recovery. And you if you're if you're only training up to um, you know within a couple of reps shy of failure, you could probably I mean this yeah. is powerlifting style training, and you need to get practice doing those lifts under load. And you can do that multiple times a week as long as your volume's not too high or not. I mean like grossly too high without too much trouble but if you take even one of those sets of that set in that session to failure that there's something very different about failure training than than um sub failure right and i preferred failure myself and so i would take those much longer sure um hiatuses from the gym and and even sub failure like a lot of the training that i do now is like powerlifting style where i leave you know two reps in the tank for each set but even then if somebody is training with you know 135 pounds for squats versus 300 or 400 pounds even not going to failure like that's a lot of stress on your central nervous Uh system so and about the i mean the human body can only take so much uh intensity even even not failure in my experience so a good example i like to give about the i won't say the magical quality of failure training but the the significance of it is during most of my you know certainly college through um, my early 30s doing a i considered a set of 315 for 20 or 25 reps that's my last warm-up set okay (laughs) um but like i found that if i uh, there were just rare occasions where, for whatever reason, I didn't do that higher rep warm-up set. I might, for instance, do two sets of 10 instead of one set of 20 with 315. And even though it's exactly the same workload, it wouldn't make me sore. Like, during those years, I could have done two sets of 10 with 315 every single day and been fine, probably, because I wasn't anywhere near the, the failure zone. But if I just did the one set with of 20 reps, where I'm starting, those last few reps are starting to get pretty difficult... Um, exact same overall workload. Something very different is going on because yeah. I get really sore from it, and I mean days of soreness. 
So um, there's there's obviously some difference in the magnitude of stress to the body doing it, uh, getting into that zone of failure. Even even though you're you're uh, equilibrating for workload overall workload, right? Right. Um, so we could shift it to uh, basically. I, I want to. I want people to understand how effective this style of training can be, and and that they're not um, they're not held prisoner to you know what the latest research says um, with regards to frequency, volume, etc. Uh, as we said earlier we don't we don't have all the studies um we don't have all the studies to understand this stuff yet people kind of think it's all set in stone um but even dr schoenfeld recently found that even bro splits like training once a week they're they can be as effective at least or maybe more effective than high frequency so uh so talk about your your stats like you, you mentioned casey butt um the formula yeah. that he has yeah. a uh, he calls it a like a maximum potential or mas maximum muscular body weight potential calculator where he measure took uh, sort of verified measurements from um bodybuilding um a lot of like top level top level amateur bodybuilders from as he says before the steroid era so that is largely taken out of the picture whether or not they were taking the juice. Um, and it's it's a simple calculator. You, you put in your height and uh, your wrist and ankle measurements to get an idea of your you know, your frame size and spits out a number of what, what's your potential, you know, and, and um, you put it on a, a body fat percentage as well, right? And most of my kind of serious training years, I, I was eight, eight or nine percent body fat probably um hardly ever did i get near to over 10 percent, which is where i am now being um, trained mostly just for functional capacity and maintenance i'm not not pushing the uh iron near like what i ever used to do but uh putting in my values from my heyday um i'm 5 8 and the heaviest i ever got at a body at a body fat i'm going to say in that eight to ten percent range, probably closer to eight percent, I got to two hundred and four pounds, and that's about somewhere between eight and eleven percent above the potential mass, maximum muscular body weight that his formula predict, which would have been like one eighty three or one eighty five, something like that. Um, I I didn't maintain that two hundred and four uh, pounds very long because I had to eat so much that it was like diminishing my quality of life to have to stuff my gullet to the brim every two hours. I mean, that's that's not a life I want to live, it, which is funny because just to gain the few extra pounds over about 197 or not 198, I maintained that for years, and I had to eat a lot, but it wasn't like um, a grotesque amount of food. So that, that was definitely a um, an exponentially greater amount of food required to get just a few more pounds of, of body weight out of there or, or on my frame. Um, and so some of the lifts that I achieved during that era – at about 197 pounds, I squatted. I squat very deep. I squatted 405 for 17 reps. I, that was my PR with that weight. Um, one time at the end of a training session where I had already done some heavy squats, I, I just on a whim, I, I squatted um, 495 for a double and 475 for five, which I didn't normally go into that low of a range. I was just curious. Right. Um, I've squatted three, 315 for 32 reps one time and just stopped because... I wanted to have something left for the rest of my workout. That was my warm-up set. Um, I straight leg deadlifted off of a, off my toes, basically, taking the bar all the way down to my feet. Um, in college years, I used to go up to 445 pounds for five or six reps. Um, I've never been a good flat bencher. I'm way too front delt um, dominant on that, and it causes a little bit of irritation, so I've always done decline bench, but I've uh, I've decline benched 315 for five or six reps, um, all at that kind of one, 197, 198 pound body weight and at about eight, eight nine percent body fat usually. Okay. Yeah, um, so obviously it's worked. So I mean, I, 
Right, and I'm, I'm not, I would never say this is the, the one right and true way to train. It worked very well for me, and it's certainly, right. I, I've gotten defensive of it over the years because I, I would get attacked. Like, well, that can't work. Well, I mean, look at my training log. It works. I mean, I come in here once every I don't, 12 or 15 days and do squats, and uh, the, it, it's there. The, <laughs> the results are there. And certainly if I were training for lower end strength, I mean, I think I could have achieved higher poundages. That was never – I was more of a bodybuilding style trainer, but I, I like having some level of, of strength as well. Right. Um, but I certainly, as a bodybuilder, uh, outlifted many, most of the power lifters in any of the gyms I ever trained in without training specifically for strength. With so someone of my same body weight, I, I could usually outlift them. And, and usually with yeah. me, like I'm, I'm squatting for reps in the power rack next to them. Exactly. What they're, what they're maxing at it at similar yeah. body weights. And I, I think, I think that is a myth, by the way, that you have to use low reps for power lifting because it's high reps are becoming a lot more popular for powerlifting because I think what people run into is you just can't train three to five reps forever um, without taking a break or, or at least training a, a significant portion of your time in the lower intensities. Um, like, for example, what is a what's a triple? A triple, like a, a set of three is like above 90% of your one rep max. And... Um, if somebody's doing that on a regular basis, they're going to just run themselves into the ground with uh, intensity and central nervous system fatigue. So um, I don't know if you've heard of a power lifter named George Lehman, but he um, he doesn't do it anymore, but he was deadlifting in the 900s and he always did 20 rep sets for a lot of his leg training, for example. So, um, And he always he always preached the value of high reps. So I think that it's good to just try, try to vary it up once in a while. Um, uh, people may not benefit as well as sticking to one rep range. So, And of course, just changing things up from time to time helps keep you from getting bored. And Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing I'll say is those, those high rep squats, especially I've, I've done both high rep squats and deadlifts, it makes training in the lower rep ranges seem so easy because yeah. if you're doing a set of, if you're going to fail on the, the 24th rep on squats, I might not know for the last 10 reps if it's my last rep or not. So that's, you know, you're, you're at right. failure for several reps in a row and it just makes, if you're doing sets of five, well, that fourth rep it can be easy and then you fail at the fifth, or, you know, you do the fifth one is kind of difficult and you fail on the sixth and you, I don't know, it just, it made any of those lower end sets that I did, which wasn't a lot, just seemed mentally so much easier. Sure. And as you've proven, the high rep stuff can build low the low end strength. Like, if you can squat four, four or five for 17, uh, it's pretty obvious that you're going to be able to squat a lot more than that for a double or a single. Um, yeah, I'll say so. that, that, for that, that PR, that was my all-time best, my previous weight session my previous squat session before that i got a pr of 15 reps with that same weight so i gained two reps um from one workout to the next even at a you know pretty advanced level of development right so right. that was one of the things i really liked about this style of training is that if it's not working you're going to know immediately that's true did I, not, did I not get enough rest did i not eat enough uh did i get sick whatever but um and there was usually some obvious reason why. Oh, like, yeah, the day before that, I, w I didn't eat enough, or um, I, you know, I had a, a demanding week at work or something and didn't sure. sleep well. But if it's, if it's working, it's going to virtually from workout to workout, you'll gain a rep or two, or you'll gain weight and reps. Right. You don't need to stick at it for months without. You know, wondering is it going to start working? You know, because you're going to weigh yourself or ma do maxes at the end. No, you you know right away. So, uh, break down <clears throat> your program for us, or the the split that you used. It was a four day split, and I would take at least one day off between each training day, but uh, usually two or even three. And the, the more advanced I got, the more I found it useful to take additional training or um, rest days in there. 
And so if this, the exec split, I believe, was uh, day one arbitrarily would be um, chest, biceps, and abs. And then I'd take a couple of days off, and then it would be quads and calves. Another couple of days off, and then delts, traps, and triceps. Uh, and then back and hamstrings, another couple of days off, and then start the rotation over again. And someone else might not need to have this exact split because they might not have the same interference issues I had. So for instance, I could never train uh, quads and hamstrings on the same day because the core lifts for those were so arduous that I had nothing left to give. The, wh whichever one went first uh, right. completely shortchanged the second exercise of the, of the session. Uh, and I also then had to offset my, my uh, squat day from my deadlift day it couldn't be the next successive training day. Even if I had three days off, I needed more than that. So it had to be um, as far away in the rotation as possible. Um, and that also, by the way, helped me not get lower back cramping, which I used to get a lot on my on my quad days from the squatting and also the, the straight leg deadlifting. Once I had those two days separated far enough in the in the program, then my lower back stopped cramping. And the issue was it was kind of chronically uh, overworked. And once it actually got enough time to, to heal, uh, that cramping issue went away. Okay. I, you know, I found myself that I just can't squat and deadlift in the same day. It's... Yeah. If I, if yeah. I squatted first, then my deadlifts would just be weak and sucky. If I deadlifted first, that was actually dangerous because my lower back was so fatigued from the deadlifts that it, w it was not safe to put that much weight on my back. Okay. That's what I found. And then issues like, um, uh, just like my my triceps couldn't be, I couldn't work those that work out before my chest because they would still be sore and weak and not strong enough to provide proper uh, assistance to my chest. And dealing with back and biceps, I couldn't train back with sore biceps. I could train biceps with a sore back, but not back with sore biceps. So it was this it took months or years to kind of juggle these things around and find out, oh, I've arrived at something that doesn't have all these interference issues, and I can get maximal effort, put, put maximal effort into each one of these body parts, and then give it plenty of time to, to recover. And it's really, that, that long recovery, it's basically just, I'm chronically in that state of like vacation rebound, you know? You, you're training your high volume, high frequency training, and then you take two weeks off and you come back and you like, you're supercharged and you're stronger than ever. Yeah. Well, do that every workout. I mean, it works. Right. I mean, it's <laughs> every single time I've gone on vacation for a week or two, yeah, I, I come back stronger. That, yeah. I would say just make that the chronic state that you're in. Yeah. So, uh, so you mentioned uh, before that you've never taken any PEDs, any performance enhancing drugs. Um, yeah, I, I took creatine briefly. I I almost took uh, androstenedione when I was like 18 or 19. When it was trendy, when the whole Mark McGuire thing was going on, um, and I, I, you know, it was, I didn't have a philosophical um, objection early on. I was just always curious. Well, what can my body do? And from about age 18 to 21 or, or thereabouts, I had a, I reached a plateau at a body weight of a 185. And so when I was in college, I had a friend who um, was in. Um, he was a, a marine sniper and he was going through their arduous training and he basically said that it, the guys in his group sat him down and said you have to take testosterone you are not going to make it through this and you're going to be a liability to us and they were in southern california and they would they would just run across the border to tijuana and get veterinary grade testosterone really and, uh, oh yeah wow. and uh, he he got me a few bottles of that when i was uh, at k-state and i was like okay if, if, I've, if I've maxed out my genetic potential naturally and I'm ready to take the next step, but I wanted to make one last ditch effort to make sure I had done everything possible because my body weight had, had been stagnant for over two years. Okay. And of course, most of my lifts weren't going anywhere. And I, one thing I thought I might be able to do was eat more. And I started um, waking myself up in the middle of the night, every single night and stuffing myself. And that was the key to go from that 185 up to about 197 or 198 okay and then a few years later i was able to you know using that same idea is it just a matter of more food well it was but that it was such a ridiculous amount of food that, that it just wasn't worth doing anymore like 
it's it's more of a hindrance yeah. to my life than than a uh, than an enhancement at that level. Okay. So the fact that I was able to start making gains again just by eating, I never ended up taking the taking the that the veterinary <laughs> para uso veterinario. <laughs> It's, was, it's, it's was, interesting. It, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, just to finish that yeah. anecdote, I, I was very close to doing that. And so I don't, you know, I don't make judgments necessarily on anyone's personal choice. But reflecting on that, I realized what I was in it for was the, the, the kind of mental and physical challenge of figuring out how to coax my body into, you know, ultimate, a state of ultimate development for, for whatever the potential that it has, right? Sure. And I, I believe there is some genetic ceiling that we all have, but you never you would never know what it is until you're looking at it in the rearview mirror, right? You just have to keep trying as hard as you can, and yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I can see what it was now, but you're also oper operating in the world of realistic uh, concerns. You know, do you want to sacrifice relationships? Do you want to do? I mean, sacrifice the being a multi-dimensional human so that you can just maximize your, your your skeletal muscle seems kind of silly to me. Right. But, but to each their own, I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> I was going to bring up that, uh, it's interesting that you discussed that your, your buddy uh, in the military was offered testosterone because a couple it of years... It wasn't yeah. formally offered, but it was a, a tacit understanding, and he, he was kind of uh, morally opposed to doing it and just to give you his sure. his physical specs he was we were about 20 or 21 at the time he was 64 and he his normal body weight was around like 170 or 175 so he's pretty slender but fairly athletic guy he ran a lot and this brutal training that they were going through it's like a navy seals type training uh he was losing body weight rapidly and he was down to like 165 and um he said like his face was sunken and you know they don't let you sleep wow. and you're with heavy backpacks and army crawling all the time and within three months of taking uh this test just plain low-grade testosterone he didn't change a single thing about what he did uh or or make an effort to eat more and he gained 35 pounds in three months yeah almost almost all muscle right you know so to him that was like it, this stuff is magical right in terms of what it does for protein synthesis, sure. it really is. It lets you, and the, a lot of those drugs were initially developed for like to help burn victims recover faster and that kind of thing. It's all it's all about protein synthesis. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to mention there's a there's a study online um, that the U.S. government did. I can't remember what it's called, but you can look at the effects of rigorous training in I th either the Marines or the SEALs. And, and how much that affects negatively affects your hormones like mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people don't realize this because all we ever hear is oh exercise is is good for your hormones you know increase your testosterone from squats um but the reality is that study showed basically that these guys after you know several weeks and months of training that way had the testosterone level of like an 80 year old man because of how um basically damaging that that is on your endocrine yeah. system yeah and of course in in a situation like that they're not just training their bodies they're trying to build mental fortitude to get through physically difficult situations as much as much as actually developing fitness and functional capacity right so sure they kind of have to go through something that's that physically arduous to to build up the you know the the mental aspects that they are going to need and wherever they're going to go and the things that they're going to have to do in their in that type of career right um so talk about some of the drawbacks on high, on low frequency training um before i discovered the importance of just doing those core movements like multiple times a week with very light weights just to maintain uh, the groove essentially um, you can feel like you're stiff and you're not you can't get into that groove easily if you're only going to squat once every 10 12 days it's going to feel kind of foreign and um, so that was an issue for a while before I got that figured out but also I think you got to kind of be mentally built for that to enjoy that kind of 
work because many many people refuse to go into that that like deep zone of failure training especially at higher reps there's a funny story when i was in high school and i was i was just basically sold on this style of training and i was like well is it just me or can i can i like uh rope in some research subject to do this so i had a buddy that he did exactly two workouts with me and the first one, I don't remember what pound did he use. I think he, it was like 135. He, was, he, was, he played basketball, so he was familiar with the squat, but he wasn't an, uh, an avid weightlifter. And he, I think he got like seven reps the first workout. And the, the protocol that I gave him was he was going to do a set of squats to failure and then immediately go to a leg extension machine that we had pre-set up. And then he was going to do that. And then he's going to come back to the squat rack with a reduced weight and go to failure again. So... Bam, 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 real quick, squat, leg extension, back to squat, that's it. And he got seven reps, and we were going to measure his gains by the uh, that initial set of squats. So he got seven reps, and we came back one week later, and he got 21 reps and stopped because he was he had enough. First of all, the, the soreness that he experienced that whole week and he was playing basketball so jumping while he sore you know he never let me hear the end of that but then he just he was like i don't care if this works you know as good as anything i'm not putting myself through that level of physical torture which to me that was yeah, like yeah. exciting to to do those those types of sets but to him it was just like nope not happening sure so it, it's got to kind of suit your personality yeah and, uh, some people and I, you know what, I, I kind of am more probably like your buddy, because um, personally, uh, I mean, I, I train pretty high intensity a lot of times, but I, I can't do like 20 rep set squat programs anymore. Like I, I did it when I was younger, when I was just getting started um, about a year in, um, but feeling, you know, like you want to throw up is a... Uh, here's a little, here's yeah. a little secret. <laughs> I, once I discovered this also in high school, I sure. never, ever got nauseated from exercise again. And it's just about sugar. Okay. As long as, at least for me, as long as I get some sort of sugary drink in me, I have to, I can't have that before starting exercise because, you know, you'll have a sugar crash. But I'll do my warm-ups and stuff. And as soon as I get pretty well into my warm-ups, I just start sipping any any sugary beverage. doesn't matter what. Okay. I never felt that workout nausea again. Yeah. But there's a there's a YouTuber um, Alec and Kiri, and I'll have to, sh- you know, share a video. He he's done this twenty rep set, set one set a week of twenty rep squats um, as an experiment, and I think his he was starting at around three fifteen mm-hmm. for twenty reps for squats, um, and over the course of a couple months he got up to like three forty five for mm-hmm. twenty. And, um, and that's just one set. So, and the the thing that he mentioned in his video where, and he talked about how he gained an an inch on his, on his legs from that, from just that. So, Mm -hmm. but, uh, he did, he did say that after about four or five weeks, like your body kind of becomes conditioned enough to, uh, to the point where you're not, you know, nauseated at the end of your, your set. So, and, and that kind of says a lot about that style of training um i don't really know of any sort of like cardiovascular program that's as efficient as as 20 reps set squats like you can do that in about four to five minutes Mm -hmm. but totally condition your body yeah Um, absolutely so yeah but I, whatever gains he got doing that once a week, I suspect he would have gained faster just doing it every other week. Okay. Having those extra recovery days. Right. That's more time for your body to, you know, put, put extra glycogen in there where it needs to be and just um, do, you know, muscle fiber protein synthesis as well. Um, that that was a realization I came to fairly late in my, you know, training journey that, uh, for a lot of my college years or college age training sessions, or um, I was doing like maybe once every eight to 10 days each. And, and just as the years went on, I added more and more days in. And I think if I had done that earlier on, my results would have come quicker. Okay. Yeah. And I, I brought up the fact that, you know, 
it's I'm not saying I can't do it anymore, but my own psychology, I'm I just enjoy like leaving one or two in the tank and doing lower reps and, and I kind of my point in bringing that up is I squat once every 9 days now whereas I used to do it like every other day or two to three times a week. Um but even in the lower rep ranges, multiple sets in the lower rep range with like an AMRAP set, for example, I'm still seeing really good results. So it's just an observation. Um, I think that this low frequency training can work in a variety of rep ranges. So. Yeah, I agree. And I, I would usually, rather than like go into a low rep phase or a high rep phase, I would usually incorporate um, at least one set from the various rep ranges in each workout, right? So I'd have that high rep as I considered a, my last warm up for a while. The thing about that that twenty rep, twenty to twenty five rep set, it seemed to be like this. Um, it did something different. Like I don't know if it gave me mental clarity, but it just made the, it felt like I was just more mentally primed to do all the rest of the the work. Okay. Or, or the rest of the workout. But I often do that, and then I would do a set. Or where I aimed for something around six reps and another where maybe uh, something in the 10, 10 rep range. I didn't go real low very much. Sometimes as low as three or four reps. Okay. But I try to get um, one or two sets uh, of each of those kind of moderate rep ranges in there in addition to that one high rep set, and that would be plenty for a workout. Okay. Um, so... You know, what, what are some things that you can tell people that, uh, you know, when, when they're busy or they have a, you know, family, full-time job, mm -hmm. people who are discouraged because they're realizing they're spending, like, all their life in the gym, like, two hours a day. And hey. how, how do people get past that and and learn to, you know, make progress on, on less? It, it doesn't take that much, that much work. It takes hard work. It doesn't take that much volume or frequency. And maybe you're not at the, you don't have to be at the absolute optimal level to get results. Doing something is better than doing nothing, but doing drastically too much is barely better than doing nothing because you might get sick, right? And then you're going to be at a deficit compared to where you even were with, without training in the first place. So, uh, and also keep in mind, look, looking around at our society, all the you know the actors that train to be Thor in a movie or whatever they're not just drinking smoothies or there's stuff in there that yeah. they might not even know about but their you know multi-million dollar uh, production team certainly knows about um, so you can't compare yourself to that the only person you can compare yourself to is yourself like like Clarence Bass said right and I, I was never competitive with others but I was always competing with my previous achievements so um, but yeah, if you're if you're a busy working person, uh, it's the perfect scenario to try this type of training. And maybe if it seems, uh, I would recommend try uh, do a hard hard couple of sets of your compound exercises once every two weeks. Keep a journal so that 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 will keep you from getting discouraged. Because even if it seems like oh I only went up five pounds in two weeks, well, uh, if you have 25 workouts in a year, yeah. Uh, five pounds is now a hundred pounds, right? Or plus. So, uh, it, it adds up. Um, and right. it's very encouraging to look back over your records and, and say, you know, wow, I really, I really have come a long way. Um, and keep other parts of your life in prior or, or in, uh, in perspective too. Like I, if you have a, a, a new child in the family or we, we just adopted a new dog. Like I, that's a commitment I take seriously, and I'm, I'm not going to have my dog, uh, a dog that's not trained yet, I don't want him tearing up the furniture and stuff, so I'm not going to have him sitting in a crate for three hours while I'm at the gym. That's, you know, that's yeah. a terrible way to treat the animal, so uh, yeah. I spend one hour training and get back home and um, have, have time to spend with my dog. That's why, that's why I like programs such as yours. Uh, uh, right now I'm doing... Um... It's, it's called fifth set training. It's by Swede Burns. He's a professional powerlifting coach. And the interesting thing about it is it's very similar to your program. It's just instead of two days between, it's about uh, one day between workouts. 
But you're working out three days a week, and you're on a nine-day rotation. So it'd be like bench press one day, squat another day, a second pressing day, and then a deadlift day. Um, and what's so cool about that program is because it's not confined to seven days in like one week, even Swede says he's, he coaches professionals and he said here and there life gets in the way and you're going to have days where you just can't train even on a whim, like spur of the moment, your boss calls you if you're on call and says, Oh, we need you. We need you at the facility now or something. You're not going to be like, oh, uh, sorry, I have to train. <laughs> so uh, there's things that happen in life. So you want your program to be flexible enough to where you can say, okay, I'm not going to scrap this week entirely, but I'm going to come in the next day and do my plan. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas some programs that are like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or they're on specific days of the week, people are starting to think, oh, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to have to just skip this workout or start over the next week i really found in in those instances where i had to take an extra day off for whatever whatever reason uh almost always i ended up having more gains that following workout so if anything it's probably going to be beneficial exactly day off yeah or two or a few and um and like you said you know you want to be a balanced individual and not just about the gym the old, you know, the older I get, I see that more and more, and how I get more joy out of life outside of the gym. Um, so, uh, I wrote down some of Katrina's. Um, that's my girlfriend. Uh, some of her gains that she made over a year or so, um, as a full-time high school math teacher teaching at a. Um, an alternative school so like this job was very mentally demanding on her because these kids came from really bad situations a lot of them and, and you know she had to witness like just horrible things these kids are going through and she had a really long commute to get there and she's going um going through some other stuff that was just like she's very um mentally drained a lot of the time and couldn't devote much time or too much physical energy to exercise or again she would get sick so i came up with a really abbreviated routine for her that was just splitting her body into two workouts and doing uh, one workout a week right so each body part came up about every um two weeks and some of the so in the one workout she would just do leg press and pull-ups and the other one she would do straight leg deadlift bench press and calf raises and that was it Okay. Maybe once in a while on a Wednesday, in the middle of the week, if she w- wasn't too drained, she would throw in like um, some shoulder work or something, right? Um, but uh, let's see. It, on her leg press, in a three month period, she increased the load for the same number of reps by 30%. That's pretty significant. Yeah. I mean, that'd be the uh, 30% increase. That's like if you're bench pressing um, 200 pounds for, for 10 reps uh, this month, and then three months from now you're bench pressing 260 for 10 reps. I think anybody would consider that pretty substantial gains, right? Right. And that's that's doing one set of leg press every other week. She would do a good warm-up. She would do a couple sets of usually just um, – um, empty barbell squats, about 45 pounds, a couple, couple sets of warm-up, and do that one set of leg press, and that was it. Every once in a while, she had extra energy. She might do a, a second set of leg press. Um, and then uh, there was another one where she, what did I say here? Oh, yeah, and uh, a single workout to workout. So from April 1st was one workout, to April 16th in 2017, she gained four reps with the same weight on leg press. Just one wow. single set of failure. So that's, I mean, that's substantial. And you can you can see that progress from workout to workout. So that's another advantage is you're not so run down all the time or just doing a programmed number of reps, wondering if you're progressing or not. You know every time you go in the gym, even though it's not that often, you know whether you're on the right track or not. Yep. There's a, yeah. also a mentality of like, 
more is better and who you know whoever does the most work is somehow superior you know regardless of whether it's the most effective uh, approach uh, i think there's definitely a mentality of um of um martyrdom i guess maybe something like that where i'm working harder than you so i don't know yeah it's uh more is not always better it's uh and, and there's a lot to be said for balance okay so uh tracy do you want to tell people about you know your business your uh, woodworking business your um you know other other topics at all uh there's a pretty major parallel. So um, earlier in the interview, I mentioned um, the type of stuff I make. Sure. And uh, I kind of just discovered this whole dimension of my personality by accident. I was I was working in a lab as a technician. And I just I wanted to do, I had just bought a small house. I was renovating and wanted to do things a little more with, with some ecological conscience. So I was installing a high efficiency wood stove because in Kansas City where I live people just throw away wood at the curb all the time you know tree trimmings and that kind of thing and in, in, I really I found myself really enjoying the the um, productive exercise of hauling and splitting woods you know swinging swinging an axe or a ball and uh, it's, it's, it's like CrossFit basically right you got to haul these heavy logs and you do this cardio aspect but you also develop a like a a skill of, of wielding an axe, right? And it, it felt much more appropriate and um, like useful than just getting a, a. It's great to be strong under a barbell, but sure. where do you put that to productive use in life, right? Well, I found that having a good amount of functional uh, capacity and strength helped that a lot. And. Uh, <laughs> It was just by kind of being romanced by logs I hauled home for firewood that I was like, man, this stuff's beautiful, some of it, right? And I just thought, can I start making anything out of these things? And sure enough, yeah. I got my house paid off. I, I took, I just took a year off from the lab thinking I might go back, but I started selling my work and, I, it's, you know, it's like starv starving artist type of existence, but it's better than working for the man. And I, sure. I was also um, definitely falling out of romance with science and seeing the... Uh, the political aspect of that and the uh, the way a lot of it's just bought and paid for and yeah <clears throat> so the the philosophy of my work is to kind of look at what the wood is already doing and trying to carve something out of there that, that honors that in some way or at least complements it um, and that's that's the gist of it and I have a, have a website if anybody's curious and seeing that best in head woodworks dot com and, and what type what types of uh, products do you create? Most of the bread and butter of what I make is a lot of um, spoons and bowls, kitchen type stuff and, and homewares. But I'll, I'll take uh, custom orders if somebody like wants their grandma's cherished spoon replicated that, you know, they've had it for generations and it broke or, um, or I'll just um, uh, make a whole set of, you know, kitchenware out of one particular log or try to really follow the grain as much as possible and have that really highlight the beauty of the wood and not just arbitrarily carve some preconceived idea out of, you know, I don't regard wood as some inert substrate that I get to impose my will on, which is how it's often treated. It's not an engineered material. It's, you know, it's a living thing that has, it has strength and beauty in, in certain ways, but you can violate that. And, and it'll break or, or just uh, won't, won't have the same aesthetic appeal. Okay. So um, my favorite, though, is restoring old tools, especially axes. And so one thing I'll do is um, we have a lot of ash trees here in particular in Kansas City that are being decimated by an insect. And I'll split those logs so that the, you know, the, the splits run true to the grain and I'll air dry that for a year or two and then hand carve handles and, and rebuild old axes is one of my favorite things. Okay. Among restoring other types of carving tools as well. That's awesome. And then I've taught, I guess, it, it's mostly called power carving, but anybody knows what an angle grinder is. In the last 10 or so years, there have been really, really cool tools made to be powered by an angle grinder that you can really quickly carve like, large free form bowls and that, that's kind of something I've been known for is 
large organically shaped free form bowls right. from, from logs. Has uh, woodworking always been something that you just were drawn to? Because I've no, seen, I, yeah. <laughs> as a as a kid, I think in seventh grade, I had to take shop class, and I hated everything about it. It was like these big, loud, scary machines that it was just you know everything was a hard, crisp corner and straight lines, and everybody had to make a, you got graded on how exactly similar your project was to the example, right? And I just I had no interest in that at all. And when I got you know, I'm hauling home logs, and I saw that, oh, the when you split a log, it has a, the grain curves this natural way, and oh, with the little training your eye, and, I mean, I can't say it's it's very different from bodybuilding, right? You're, you're doing that, you're trying to sculpt a physique for its aesthetic appeal, yeah. right? And I would try to sculpt a, 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 a an object of wood that enhances the way the grain is flowing, visually, but also for strength. So I'd find myself looking at this and go, oh, the way this grain sweeps here is perfect for making a spatula. That's exactly the, the kind of little sweep in the grain I look for. So now I just, when I'm breaking logs down, that's that's one of the things I do is challenge myself to find um, that work piece that, that is going to really enhance what is already going on in there. And you've, you've made a lot of uh, workout contraptions, a lot of like uh, wood... wood and metal yeah. and that's just uh, yeah. necessity being the mother of invention so yeah. I, I had a playground injury when i was seven years old that uh, i broke all three bones in my right arm really bad like they were sticking out of the skin and bleeding and it never healed quite straight and that's it's been a, a frustration of mine so i, I can't that, that's as far as i can bend this arm and okay. it's caused me problems um working the muscles especially of my torso so my my bicep and tricep work pretty good but it just doesn't feel right in certain ways and i've had to try to initially i was building equipment to try to compensate for that but then i started to realize man the biomechanics of this thing that i made are, are like they're better than hammer strength machines or, or stuff i was you know commercially made equipment that i i just came to realize a lot of the old school stuff that was made in the 70s 80s 1990s was actually superior because I didn't try to overcomplicate it and make it look snazzy. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, it was, they built iterations. So they made a prototype and then somebody tested it and then they refined the design and built it again. And now everything's just done on CAD. And right. if, it, if it looks good on a computer design, they just go with it and it can have horrible biomechanics. One of my worst things I hate at the leg press at the gym I was going to for a while had a big concave foot plate. When nowhere you put your feet on there, did you feel like you had a nice solid bearing up against the foot plate? Right, it was just super distracting. Although yeah. the rest of the machine was like super heavy duty, I just I hated that. Did did anyone who took part in designing that thing actually try it out and see if it felt comfortable? Apparently not. So a, a lot of the machines I made were the parameters were it had to be simple to construct. It had to like bolt on and off of my rack easily or stay on the rack and not be in the way during use. Um, preferably, I would want it to have multi-function. So uh, the lab leverage apparatus, as I called it, that is in several of my videos, was uh, definitely one of those where I could do anything from like hack squats to shrugs, pull downs, um, um, clean and press type movements, uh, a whole, whole range of, it was basically like an entire home gym yeah. that bolted onto a power rack. Cool. And that, that was just for fun, too. It was very similar to um, trying to – the challenge of finding just the right thing in a piece of wood was, like, how do you – work working within all those various constraints, uh, build something, and also do it cheap. And, you know, so that was just a way to challenge myself to ha have more fun with my, you know, training journey. Once I got my, my own place, my own garage to – to dabble in with, with that kind of stuff I, I really enjoyed and I <laughs> I might spend three hours in the gym and only 45 minutes of that is actually d lifting you know and the rest of the yeah, time I'm like yeah. tinkering and trying something out so yeah I've I've made a few things but not anywhere near as creative you know I made a cable machine um I bought like one of those little uh the cylinders uh that for cranes basically and I drilled uh, into concrete, so it was in uh -huh. the it was in the floor, yeah. and I could do like cable rows and uh -huh. curls and stuff like that. And on the other side of it was on the ceiling uh, of my porch. So, but yeah, 
yeah, it, it's fun to to experiment and and make things like that. I love so, watching, yeah, you know, YouTube videos of like people in the developing world that just like they they have like some little patch of dirt to train on, you know, and they're like yeah. using old train wheels or whatever they can find to, that, that's heavy, um, or, or places like uh, in like Southeast Asia where they just made their stuff out of bamboo. I mean, yeah, use what you got. That, that's always a lot more inspiring to me than somebody in a you know in a hundred thousand dollar facility. Right. So uh, talk about how people can contact you. Um, you know, do you do private coaching as well? Yeah, a, a limited okay. amount. But any certainly, if anybody um, wants to contact me through my YouTube channel, that's an uh, easy way to get a hold of me. Um, uh, rates are very reasonable. I don't, I don't have the the magic initials behind my name that that deem me legit, you know, to, to give advice. But I have decades of experience doing this, and I mean, I, my educational credentials are. I do have a degree in biochemistry with essentially a a minor in um, exercise physiology um, from K State. But you know, just mostly, uh, much more important than that is just a. Uh, a long career of you know consistent training and, and thinking about that stuff critically and applying trial and error and yeah I mean I um I'll just put this I'll just add this in there that you know a lot of the stuff that we're talking about uh, is based off of our experiences and everybody's experience is going to be different so depending on age uh, work schedule how busy you are how many uh, children you have etc there you know people are going to have varying levels of recoverability and unless someone spent a considerable amount of time researching and reading about this stuff it can be hard for someone to figure out for themselves you know what level of volume and intensity and frequency is right for them and that's where where a coach can kind of come in because they've been there before and, you know, they've worked with other people and helped them establish uh, baselines for themselves and, and improve. So uh, do you have anything to add, Tracy? No, I, I mean, I, I pretty sure. much agree with everything you're. Yeah, into. I mean, I've, I've had a coach before myself and, um, you know, it was it was nice to have when when I didn't know any better, when I was just training the wrong way. So. It's definitely useful, um, even at any level, even if somebody, I mean, people have been doing powerlifting for years still have coaches because oftentimes it's, it's useful to have somebody directing your training. That's not yourself. So, yeah, it can, yeah, it's kind of hard to see yourself objectively. It's a lot easier to, to see other people yeah. uh, objectively. <laughs> yeah. And I would certainly have a very um, acute attention to someone's particular situation and goals. And I see a lot of coaches that it seems like they have a sort of a one size fits all approach or they're, they're, even though I'm super fond of the low frequency, super high intensity that worked well, very well for me, but I know that's not going to work for somebody who's in their sixties, for instance. Um, you gotta have a sensibility about <laughs> uh, not, and not just, constraints of, of age and, and other commitments, but personality too, you know, yeah. because no one's sticking with any program that they don't enjoy. I have, yeah. I have kind of a secret too, that, that goes along with this. It's, um, so I used to know a owner of a personal training gym. I'm not going to name his name, but he would always talk about, you know, when, when we discussed this idea of low frequency training, he said, well, that wouldn't be good for business. So there's definitely something to be said about that. There's there's trainers out there that are going to want to train you like every every other day or as frequent well, as possible. They're by the hour or even yeah. by the minute sometimes, so, right? Yeah. So I hope people can keep that in mind too. Just because you're training frequently, it doesn't mean that it's superior. Sometimes there's ulterior motives involved. Some people, so. I mean, I, and I make no judgments about this either like they really enjoy the social aspect of their gym time right and they want to go every every day or, or you know as, yeah. as often as they can and there's nothing wrong with that uh, certainly just be aware that if you're actually 
putting in some significant efforts during those times, you you might you might not be doing the best thing for your progress right. or for your fitness, but uh, maybe that's not the most important thing. Sure. So, uh, Tracy, any closing remarks about uh, training philosophy or, you know, volume, frequency, anything? Uh, again, I, I would just say I wouldn't try to say this is the only way to train or, you know, that I'm some guru about it or anything. I didn't discover it all by myself. I kind of took it um, as it was presented to me and, and made my own adjustments, but it's, it's been very successful, and I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about it because it's. I feel like uh, over the <laughs> many, many times in gyms in my younger years, people would ask me about my training program, and I would tell them, and they would just be disbelief, like they thought I was pulling their leg. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, and just uh, <laughs> just building off of that, People get caught up in the minutia, kind of like what we were uh, alluding to before, and you know, arguing about volume, frequency, and things like that. It only is as important as whether or not somebody's getting actually getting results, measurable results. If if someone's actually getting stronger with what they're doing and they're not burying themselves, then they're on the right track. But um, you could show me any study saying frequency is better than, um, or high frequency is better than low, but if, if somebody is, you know, burying themselves, um, it's not applicable in that situation. And we just don't have the long-term data to even make that um, assertion that mm -hmm. high frequency so, is superior. And my, so. my long-term data is my 25 plus years of, of yeah. workouts, right? It's, it's right there in black and white. Right. For at least one person. Yep. Well, uh, Tracy, a.k.a. Bastion Head, thank you for uh, taking the time to go over, you know, all your experience and your wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And uh, I hope that people can benefit from this. Thank you. It was my pleasure.